How's everybody doing? Come on, re ready for lunch, right? Um, let's talk about the virtual dorm, but let me quickly introduce myself first. Stefan, I'm from Berlin, Germany. In Berlin, I do a little bit of community work. I teach CSS with CSS classes sometimes, running a few meetups, and I work for Contentful. So we're basically a content management infrastructure, API first in the cloud. So when you're building single page apps and you don't want to set up a database or an Apache server to give your coworkers something to edit data, then you can give Contentful a try and then you get an API and an interface for your people to edit content, which is pretty, pretty sweet when you're a front-end developer like I am. And hard to overlook, one's a jazz part two. Um, we started, um, how much did you tell Dominic? We started with this last year. <laughs> so you see there the Ruhr.js conference. It was eight people or 10 people in onesies. I think there were four or five on stage. It was a lot of fun, can highly recommend it. If you want to join us, let us know. And who here is developing front-end stuff for longer than five years? All right. 2013, what happened th 2013? React was released, and maybe it's just me, but who remembers who he or she was when React was released? Then it's, okay, it's probably just me. So when I, when I saw it for the first time, I was like, I'm not impressed. I don't get it. And to be sure, or to be fair, I didn't understand the whole thing when I saw it for the first time. And then a few years later, my impression of React changed because it was in, uh, entering the industry. And when someone asked me then, it's like, hey, what is React? I would say something like this. It's super fast, it's revolutionary because of the virtual DOM and JSX. And basically, it's just like magic, right? A lot of really smart people got together in a room and programmed some stuff that I will probably not understand. But I'm doing front-end development now for seven years, and le let me tell you something that I learned. There is no magic in code. There's just, it, it is like it is. But sometimes when we're developing stuff or when we're hitting framework borders, it feels like magic, right? You hit a dead end, you cannot solve the problem, you don't understand at all what's going on. And another thing that I learned over the years is when this happens, what should you do? Take a break, <laughs> sleep over it, drink a tea, meet some friends, go out. And the next time it will be probably better. And then you experience that in the morning. Oh, I don't know what happened yesterday, but now I understand it, right? What I usually do is then I meet some friends and I've got some, a friend, his name is Matthias. And every once in a while I'm then like, hey Matthias, let's meet. And there are two ways that I can do this. There's the imperative way. So Matthias lives just around the corner, so I could give him a call and could say, Matthias, get out of your door, go to the left, go to Frankfurt Allee, that's in Berlin, go to the Proskauer Straße, go to the park, then to the left again, and then ring the bell at the number 22. That's where I live. So the imperative program paradigm uses statements that change a program state. So basically, my friend Matthias is the program state here. But we're in 2018, and what we usually do is today, we use the de declarative, declarative way of doing things. We're all owning smartphones, right? So what I do, if I want uh, to invite someone to my place, it's like, here's the address, right? I don't care how you do it. You probably will just put the address in Google Maps, and then it works. So the declarative programming way of doing things is expressing logic of computation without describing the actual flow. And this works in programming too, right? If I want to double values in an array, I can, could do it imperatively. So I create a new array, I push values into it, I double it, and I define what there has to be done. Or I use the declarative way, which is like using array map, and it's like, I don't care how you do it. Double the values, that's what I want to have. And the same thing applies for interfaces. So I built this little fancy button here which <laughs> is probably not production ready, but yeah, I could, could do the, this in an imperative way, which means that I have, have to grab the button, I have to attach the event listener, then I have to figure out, okay, how do I change classes, and what's the state of the button, and then toggle something, 
So I'm defining step by step what I have to do. Or I go with a declarative way, which is like, I want to have a button. This button should accept some state, and this is how it should look at the end. So when you write this kind of code today, you're not writing it like that. Usually it's included in something like this. Doesn't matter what much in what framework you are, but you're um, exporting a class somehow, then you have a render function, and then you've got this code in there. And when I saw this for the first time five years ago, I was like, that's not JavaScript. <laughs> what is that? Which brings me to the first part of this talk, which is code transformations. So when we want to write code like that, we have to do three things. So we've got a JavaScript file. Then we have to parse it to a kind of tree structure. Then we have to transform it with the stuff we want to change, right? And then we have to generate the code that should come out of it. So let's have a look at an example here. So I'm having a year, creating a new date, and then I'm having a template literal with this colon syntax that is now kind of popular in Slack and messengers and stuff. And I have Jerry's here's, and then I'm logging the message. Surprisingly, I don't see the party popper now, right? Because JavaScript doesn't understand the colon syntax. So how could we make that work? We could use a tool, Babel, really common these days. So let's have a quick look at how we could make that work with Babel. So first of all, we have to do the parsing. This works in Babel with a tool that is called Babylon. So let's bring it in, require it, use the parse function, then you've got a code, uh, code variable that holds a string of source code. And then you, we have got something that is called AST, which is the return value of this parse. AST stands for abstract syntax tree. And this is actually the abstract syntax tree for the code you just saw. It looks really scary, but actually it's kind of okay. So when you look at the first node, it's a program node that holds all the others and all the references. Then you've got a variable declaration or then somewhere else, you've got an expression statement. So let's have a look at this in detail. So when we have this one line of JavaScript, the AST of that looks like this. So we've got a variable declaration. We've got a variable declarator. We've got an identifier, template literal, template element, an identifier, and another template element. I think this is super, super interesting. And when you want to analyze that without um, writing scripts yourself, there's this really handy tool that is called AST Explorer. You can just paste some code in there, and then you can play around with what Babel would work with. This is super interesting. So now we've got the AST. Now it's time for transformation. And transformation works with something that is so-called the visitor pattern. And this was described by the Gang of Four, and uh, it's four authors that wrote the famous book that was called Design Patterns, Elements of Reusable Object-Oriented Software. So how does this design pattern work? So we have here our tree, and now we're just visiting every node of this tree. And we've got an enter hook here, and then we enter another one, and we enter another one, and we're going down the tree until we hit a dead end. Now it's time to exit, and go to the next one, and go down, and go down and exit, and exit, and exit, until we have touched all the nodes. So how could we make this work? So we require another dependency, which is traverse from the bubble traverse package. So we've got the code in a string, we parse it in an AST, and then we've got this traverse function that has an enter function available that we can define, and then we can check, hey, what kind of type of node is this? And if it is a template element in this case, I'm doing a string replacement for the ta-da with, uh, with a proper Unicode code point. And then we have the last step, which is generate. You can use Babel generator for that. And this is straightforward. So you bring in another dependency, which is generate. And when you have now this changed AST, you can just bump it in. And then I will log all the things. So when I execute this code now, and it's exactly the same code you just saw, so there are the three dependencies. There's the string, then there's the AST, and the traversing and the logging. So when I execute this code now, I just make tada work in my own JavaScript, right? When you think of that, 
you can now, with tools like that, build whatever you want. But this is usually not what you want to do. You want to write a Babel plugin. So with this knowledge you have now, Babel plugins work like that. You have to export a function that returns an object. And here you see the visitor again, right? Then you see to which elements you want to react. And then you can do the same thing. If you're interested in how to write your own Babel plugin, James Kyle wrote this excellent um, um, it's, it's a GitHub repository, but it's called Babel Handbook. And this helps you to get started if you want to. And why is this crocodile talking about Babel here, right? Because JSX, which stands for JavaScript Syntax Extension, is just another transform. So when we look at this code here, and we look at the AST that it um, um, will generate, we've got a return statement, we've got a JSX element, we've got a JSX opening element, JSX text, and a JSX closing element. So when we execute this, we get this. React create element. Hmm. So every JSX element is actually a function call. But what happens if we don't want to use React, right? There's this thing that is called JSX pragma that can go into config or in a comment block um, in, your, in your source files. So then the same analyzation takes place, right? Just grab the AST, there's a comment block, and there's this thing that defines what comes out of the transformation. So with this, we got a whatever function. Whatever is not the most expressive name, though. So let's go with H, which is not more expressive. But people use H, right? So and if you ever have wondered why you have to import something, even if it is not in your JavaScript code, that is the reason. It will be transformed. And in this case, H will pop up later after the transformation. So why H? H first appeared in a GitHub repository that was called HyperScript. So it's a mixture of, hyper hyper of HTML <laughs> and uh, JavaScript. And the idea was that we can start defining interfaces in a declarative way. So this was the idea. We have an H function that gets a node name, some attributes, and some children. Then we grab the node name and we create a new DOM element. We iterate over all the attributes and set these to the newly created element. And then we go over all the children that were passed in, check if it is a string. If so, we have to create a text node. And otherwise, just append these um, new children. This way, you're going recursively, recursively down, and you can create DOM. So when you execute this, for example, you got DOM elements back without calling class list or without calling in a text or something like that. That just works. So makes, let's make the example a little bit more useful. Let's add a container around it and list. And if you're not familiar with this kind of um, way of writing code, this is what it would like, uh, what it would be in JSX. So it's just a div with a headline and a list and some items. But uh, to make clear how this works, let's go with H here. So we've got this app now. And now we need, need a render function. So in this render function accepts a state. Then it creates a new app, which returns DOM elements. And then there is the current app, if there is one. So there are two ways. If, it, if, there's no, no, if there are no DOM elements yet, we have to append an element. And otherwise, we have to replace the current element, right? Because otherwise, you've got more and more, more and more elements. So we have to replace at some points. This is why there is current app, uh, this current app check. And then we de define some state. So some people that are hanging around at JS Heroes, and you see the panda there. And then we call render. And this is the result. This way you can write DOM in a nicely declarative way. But it's not perfect yet. So let's do, let's bring in some changes to the DOM in it. So I'm defining an interval here. Every second, a new random person will be added to the list. So when I execute this, and I open the Chrome DevTools, and I enable paint flashing, which shows how much work the browser actually has to do, we see that it is re-rendering all the time, every ta everything all the time. This is a lot of work to do for the browser. And when you read the Preact documentation, for example, you find this statement. 
We want to render components and have them updated only when data changes. That's where the power of VDAM diffing shines. So remember, five years ago, I read that and I was like, the what? <laughs> what is going on? So the VDOM is a lightweight representation of the structure of a DOM tree. This structure can be realized by recursively comparing it against the current DOM tree. And when you look actually at GitHub, there are a lot of implementations out there. And they reach from 6,000 downloads to 2 million downloads. And I don't want to go into the what, which one is better, which one is faster, and all these kind of discussion. I just want to talk about how these work. So let's have a look at the H function again. So at the current stage, we had this H, right? This gets attributes and node names and children and returns DOM elements. But we want to do something else, maybe. Let's just flip this around and create a virtual DOM node. So a virtual DOM node actually is just an object that holds this information. And what you see there is a virtual DOM factory. So now we have our app. And when we execute this the same way as we did before, we don't get DOM elements anymore, right? Now we get the virtual DOM. Just a big nested object with configuration. So we need a new function here, and let's call it render node. So what should render node do? Well, it extracts all the properties we're talking about. Then it checks if it is a text node. So split is a function that is only available on text nodes. Then we create a new element. We set the attributes. And then we iterate over all the children and return the element. It's the same approach going recursively down th uh, the structure. And this is what we had in our render function. This is now also not working anymore. So we have to bring in render node here. And then we have the same result. Great. Well done, Stefan. But now we have more control. Because now we have this data structure available, which we can work with. And the first thing I want to talk about is component rendering. So this is not how a component looks like today. right? Usually, we write something like this. We have a constructor. We set some state. And then we've got this render function that returns the virtual DOM. This means that we have to adjust render node, right? Render node at this point doesn't know how to deal with these kind of classes. Right now, it can only deal with a JavaScript object that represents something like h1, a span, or a div. So let's bring in a little condition here. So if the node name, which is span, h1, or whatever you have in HTML, is a string, do the same stuff as before. But if it is a function, classes are functions, right? Initialize the component. This is what you just saw. The node name is here, app. And then call component.render with the state the component itself has. And then, and this is one key part here, attach the DOM element that is the result on the component itself. And this is super, super smart. A component holds a DOM reference to the rendered element, which makes then the next thing working, which is set state. So let's define set state here. You've got the same class, and I bring in the, the interval. So I'm changing the state of this class every second, right? So in set state, all it does is it, it updates the state. Well, no surprise. And then there's this function that is called render component. And render component is super, super cool. So let's have a quick look. So this is render component. And this is where this connection between the VDOM and DOM comes into place. It gets a component. The DOM state is stored in, co in component.base. So let's grab that. And then we call render, and we render a new DOM, and we set it as the new component base. And then we can replace these two things. This means once a component is, component is injected into the DOM, it works by itself. You don't have to deal with the render stuff anymore. Calls set state, and it works. 
So when you have, for example, document body, and you inject something like this, you've got an app, a main, sidebar, widget, and a few other components. When you now call set, uh, set state on the sidebar, <coughs> then it calls render component, and it calls itself render, which then means that the others below will be rendered. And you don't have to work with this. This works by itself. So with this kind of structure, when we inspect it again, and I adjusted it to have a people component, you see that the browser has less work to do. It doesn't have to re-render the whole app every time. So once you have this structure, right? this is common virtual, virtual DOM practice, just bring in the app and then don't uh, deal with it anymore, with rendering. This is super, super nice. But still, you saw that we are re-rendering all the people all the time, right? I think we can save some work here, which brings in diffing. So we only want to um, touch the DOM when something changes in the virtual DOM, right? So let's have a look at the render component again. What do we have here? We have here the current state of the DOM. And we have here the result of render, which is the virtual DOM. And these look kind of similar. Right? This is the whole idea of it. So let's start all over again. In my example, when there are 100 people in there, I don't want to call replace child and replace 100 people again. I only want to add one person. So let's start from scratch. So render component is called after set state. Here we get the re VDOM from the component render call. And in component.base is the current DOM state. And then let's just define a diff function that compares these two. And the, this diff function then returns the new DOM object, right? Because for the next circle, we need the reference for the DOM. So let's make the diff function work. Here we have the diff. It accepts the DOM, the current state of the DOM, and a V node. And let's just ma make it work initially, right? So let's create a new DOM and replace the old one and return the new DOM. Nice. But now we, haven't have, haven't, we didn't improve anything. So for my simple use case, I'm just adding new children to the, uh, to the virtual DOM node, right? So I'm just checking, hey, do they have the same number of children? If they don't have the same number, then I'm defining a Boolean which is has new kids. And then instead of replacing 100 people, I'm just adding one one person, because this is what changed. And this is virtual DOM diffing. So with this, when I enable paint flashing, you see that there's only one person added at a time. This is much less work for the browser to do then. So the overall rule here is only touch what actually changed. So when we look at these two structures again, what can we compare? We can compare the node name, the attributes, and the child nodes. When you look at these three options, you probably know that this is not the best implementation here, right? So we could now throw this away again. I could start implementing, hey, is, it, is the span still a span, or is it now a diff? Then I have to replace it properly. Does it have the same attributes? OK. Are the children the same? And then op optimize as much as possible, right? Because we want to save work and be fast. I didn't go down that rabbit hole, but if you're interested in that, Jason Miller gave an excellent talk at JSConfU last year, which goes into the nitty gritty details why preact is fast. So at this state, my app had 3.75 kilobytes. It was 129 lines of code. It's far away from being perfect. But it supports subtree rendering and a virtual DOM mechanism. I could have now started to implement the diffing mechanism, right? But at the end, I would have come out here. <laughs> and I'm sure we don't need another <laughs> virtual DOM library out there. Preact, all the others, they are optimized and are covering all the case. And of course, they are production ready. And I didn't want to improve and improve and improve. So with this approach of virtual DOM, you've got a few benefits. 
So the first one is you can write your code in a declarative way. You can define what you expect. And you don't have to deal with the DOM itself or, hey, how do I change a class or stuff like that. That just works. You have smart and selective re-rendering. So only re-render the stuff that goes down the tree, right? And limit the DOM operations you have to do. You don't have to ask a DOM node anymore, hey, what's your state? Because you have this data available in the VDOM node that is right at your fingertips. And you can limit the DOM access with proper diffing between what is in the DOM right now and what should it be when I look at the VDOM. And when you have this overall structure, writing performant JavaScript and touching the DOM is always limit or do as, le as, uh, as, less pos as little possible, as less or as little, not much reads <laughs> in the DOM, <laughs> and batch all the writes. So with this kind of structure, you can also build render queues, right, so that you do all the writes in the same moment, instead of doing writing, reading, writing, reading, which causes a lot of work for, for the browser to do. And then you put everything maybe in a request animation frame, and this way you can make it a little bit faster. So in the preparation of this code, uh, of this talk, I read a lot of Preact code. And as developers, usually we read more code than we write, right? So I spend a lot of time and I started the preparation for this talk three weeks ago, and I had this little voice in my head that was this. You will never get it, dude. And I had a lot of sleepless nights. And I took a lot of breaks. Matthias was there a lot of times, and I also did the mistake. What I do is when I'm super stressed, I go out for a party to be hungover on Sunday. <laughs> awesome. But then at some point, it actually made sense. And my implementation of the virtual DOM worked. And this is something we have to know and to learn in our journey as developers, right? So sometimes it just takes time to understand things. And we have to be patient and we have to learn step by step. Because at the end, there's just no magic in code. And this is how it works. Thank you.